So, Jeffrey, what we're going to do this Shabbat, uh, which is not our custom, of course, our minhag, is I'm going to offer a few words, and then Rabbi James is going to offer a few words, and we're going to focus on two different aspects. There are so many aspects of what we could talk about, um, but we're, I'm going to focus more, let's say, on the general experience of this past week and a couple of Torah thoughts to reflect on regarding what's occurred. And Jenny as well will offer some Torah thoughts too, but with a focus perhaps more on the pastoral and emotional, spiritual, psycho-spiritual experience that really is also Jenny uh, really like her wheelhouse in terms of thinking this through as well. So what I want to say first of all is that it says in this, and many of you know this story, in the Torah, when Aaron, Moses' brothers, two sons are killed with a strange fire, it says. The words in the Torah say right after that, Vayidom Aaron, Vayidom Aaron. It says, and Aaron was silent. And many of the rabbis say, you know, how can it be after the devastating tragedy of losing your two children, that Aaron can be silent. But I think this week we understand that there are no adequate words, no adequate words to describe the devastation, the tragedy, and the massacre of our people that happened last week. Shabbat, Simchat Torah, Shemin Yatzot. Vayidom Aron. If I wasn't, and Jenny, we were not your rabbis, I could completely say all we could do is just sit and cry forever. That would be the appropriate response. But I know, we know, we're searching for something in our tradition, in our people, something. So we offer this with the humility that what we say here are working thoughts. Working thoughts. They're not complete. They're not polished. They're raw. They're an attempt to give you and, frankly, to us something to hold on to in a time of utter fear and utter destruction and utter tohu vavohu chaos and utter sadness. Just to look at this week and what happened. All week, Jenny and I have been looking at our children. Rav, you know, is in college and facing the complexity of college campuses right now in this time. Many of you, I'm sure, are very aware. Adi was supposed to leave on Monday for his gap year in Israel, which obviously has been postponed. And I look at Natan, sixth grader, can we even begin to imagine Babies, parents who covered over their children, parents who put their babies in the shelter while they tried to fight off terrorists with no weapons or little weapons. Fleeing young people at a concert, running for their lives, people whose houses were burned and people burned alive. Elderly people, grandmothers, 
some who survived the Holocaust? One Irish father, Irish Israeli, he saw that. His daughter, eight years old, he didn't know whether she lived <clears throat> or died or was kept taken hostage. And he said in the interview, when he found out she was killed, he said, yes. At least she's not being held hostage. We can't even begin to fathom or imagine what it feels like for the hostages right now. Toddlers with their parents or mothers with a war going on on top of them. Nine eleven, the Shoah, pogroms. It was the story of this general who heard his son and a writer and journalist for Haaretz, which is like Israel's largest newspaper, kind of like the New York Times of Israel, who heard his son say, there are Hamas terrorists on our kibbutz. And with a gun in his pocket, he drove down from the Tel Aviv area to the Gaza area, and personally killed terrorists, saved, hurt, and brought back with a group of others, found others who did the same thing. And in a surreal, impossible to imagine moment, eventually knocks on the defense, you know, the sealed room of his son and says, son, Abba's here. heroism of who's fighting this war right now are generally speaking 18, 19, 20, 20 year old kids. My kid's age, our kid's age, with reservists of people including 30, 40, and 50 year olds. But these 18 to 22 year old kids who should be at concerts or studying or doing the normal army service, they know that they are in a battle for their lives and many of them will be hurt and some will not come home. And if it wasn't clear enough, Hamas, may they be eradicated, this was not just attack against Jews and Israel. It wasn't just attack against the United States or the Western world. It was attack against Jews everywhere. All of us even here in Raleigh, North Carolina, at Beth Meyer Synagogue, people are apoplectic. 
I understand. People in this congregation have family members or sent their children who are, quote unquote, living in Israel this year. Or we have Israeli Americans in our congregation. My first cousins, the best man at our wedding. The degree of connection between us and what's happening in Israel, it's not, as I said yesterday, it's not one degree, it's us. It's us. And just to take a moment to think about others who are not Israeli, not Jewish, but were either just at the concert, which is completely appropriate in a democracy and free country, or, for example, work as foreign workers in the Gaza Envelope area, like numerous Thai nationals and citizens were, who were killed and are also kidnapped. European citizens, Germans, French, South Americans, some of them with Jewish descent, some with not without. It's irrelevant. There are brothers and sisters. And then to see in the world some deranged people, whatever their politics are on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, believe in their sick, depraved thinking that Hamas, a misogynistic, homophobic, radical, hating, oppressing entity who wantonly massacres innocents are freedom fighters? Freedom fighters? I don't care, and all you know me, I'm no fan of Prime Minister Be uh, Netanyahu. I'm no fan of many current Israeli government policies and going before dealing with the Israeli-Palestinian challenge. We this summer as a shul went and visited Israel to learn and to connect like many of you have done with me and Jenny. And we saw that complexity up close we were literally up on the northern border where Hezbollah and some of you with me are here today. No, you could see where Hezbollah was. They pointed, it was like you could throw a rock. This is not a politics moment. I know you all know this here, but I'm saying it for everyone to watch this online later. This was a massacre of innocent people by a deranged and sick, radical Islam. Not, he would not even consider it proper Islam. Radical, disgusting perversion of Islam that is equivalent to what happened on 9-11. And anyone that celebrates is like someone who celebrated 9-11, which is depraved and deranged. There aren't enough words to describe the sickness in the head of someone who would say such a thing. Let me be clear, you can support or disagree with Israeli policy and still say this was depraved and deranged. If you do not see that line, then you are immoral, you are depraved, you don't understand what it means to abide by the highest values of the Torah or any sacred scripture. It disgusts me. It's repugnant. A couple quick Torah thoughts. There's a famous line of the Torah, it's actually in the Talmud, that deals with, in various ways, how one must protect oneself. 
Talmud says, if someone comes to rise up to kill you, you must kill them first. While we absolutely, and I want to be clear here, we absolutely must, as a Jewish community, show how we are different than those barbaric terrorists, we never celebrate nor in any way dismiss the killing of innocents, of Palestinian innocents, which has happened and sadly will continue to happen. We know. And our, why we are a Jews, why I'm proud to be a Jew, why I'm proud of Israel, is we know that there is no deliberate attempt to hurt or kill innocents. We are following, ultimately, self-defense in the largest sense of what self-defense means. But what distinguishes us from them is we are making efforts to focus on eliminating the enemy and not doing, ultimately, although I understand the feeling, vengeance killing. If you saw, there actually are some terrorists who were caught who are being served in Israeli hospitals. I must admit that when I saw that, that any resources of our state, of the Jewish state, is going to preserve the life of terrorists, it made me want to vomit. But that is what makes us different. And I am extremely proud that that is what our Jewish values stand for, and that was what Israel stands for. As long as we do that, we hold the moral upper hand. Another piece. We should be, this is not a political statement, but President Biden's comments, Secretary of State Blinken, a Jew, the comments of Defense Secretary Austin, the moving of ships from the American military closer to the border, the wall-to-wall -wall support of the United States should make us all so, so proud of our country. This is not a moment simply for words. It's a time for action. And Israel needs to know that America is not only at her back, but at her shoulder and willing to put out weapons and do things. And when the president said to, because you know ultimately Iran is back behind the scenes, how much we don't know, but it's behind, that when he said, and they said, don't, don't. It's very critically important that America is there to say that, not just Israel, as a statement beyond to anyone. And something we can do, I hope you'll consider after Shabbat, is to send notes to our local Congress people and senators, not to mention the president, just to thank our government for standing up for the highest of American values. And, and, I just taught this this week to my, to our like Jewish Essentials intro class. And unbelievably this week, it was a class that months before was supposed to focus on Israel and Zionism. And one of the tenets which I explained to the class, which Israel is rooted on, and we are seeing it happen now, the Jewish people learned over a millennia, two millennia, to our great sadness, there is no one else coming. Push comes to shove. The Jewish people has to be ready to take care of itself. That does not mean that we don't appreciate 
and Israel doesn't appreciate American back and support. It's critical. It's extraordinarily important. But right now, the Zionist idea that ultimately Israel will not wait for someone else to solve the problem is now, is now. And be sure you're aware, friends, when all the criticism comes on Israel for what comes next. And I, I want to be clear. I, I, I'm, I, am, I, ho- I know you're with me. Because what happened this past Shabbat, it was shocking. It was surprising. It was, they're calling it the surprise attack. I mean, it's what it is in Hebrew. I've been watching the Israeli sites. But the greatest army military intelligence This happened that bulldozers go through the fence. I know this is not the time for analysis of what happened wrong. I simply say that to say, please God, I pray that Israel's not walking to any traps, anything well prepared. This is going to take the intelligence support of the United States, of other countries of goodwill, to make sure that what Israel does next not only preserves human life of innocence as much as possible to the Palestinians, but does not throw our young people to the slaughter. We should pray for that as well. And remember, there is an exit out of Gaza to Egypt. This is a moment where Egypt is being called to task as well. Will they stand idly by? Will they allow humanitarian passage of not only innocence, but American Palestinians? There are Palestinian with American passports who deserve to be let free. Non-combatants. And we all know that's only happening through Egypt. This is a moment for their moral question. What do they stand for? Tov, I conclude with this. This week's Torah portion talks about Selem Elohim, that every person is made in the image of God. And we, in our community, we know that's true, that every person has infinite value, no matter who they are, who they are. And that's why, for example, Israel was willing to make prisoner exchanges. I was explaining this to my son this week, Natan. For the remains of dead soldiers, Israeli, when you have thousands of Palestinian prisoners and Hamas prisoners back. Because we believe in the value of human life at nearly the expense of all other things. That includes innocent Palestinians. Very important we hold that, or we are hypocrites. And it has within it selim, which means image in Hebrew, but sel, which means shade and shadow. And I shared it this week, and I want to share it again. Why is the word shadow in, in the image of God? Why? My take on this is because each individual person is a world. Each individual person We try to understand what they're going through, but there's a piece that is shaded that we can't. We cannot fully grasp what is it like for a parent right now whose child is being held hostage in Gaza. We can feel for them, but there's a shade. What's it like for people here in our own congregation who have family members, friends, children, in Israel right now. We can appreciate it. And there have been so many non-Jews, I hope you've gotten this as well, many non-Jewish clergy, friends of our congregation who have reached out to me and written the most beautiful notes of support. It's been so heartwarming and important with comments like, I cannot fully grasp. There's a shade, there's a shadow. But I try, and I can't even imagine what you're going through. In my early morning process, 
I have walked through so many journeys of death and mourning with hundreds of times with all of you. But this is the first time as a mourner that I, it's like a shade was lifted for me. Because it's not the same. There's a difference between serving and helping as much as I feel it on my heart, someone else going through mourning, and watching my own mother go into the ground. That's part of Tzelem Elohim. And when Israel says that a million Palestinians should move down, we need to be the people that say, can we understand what that feels like, even if justified? Elderly, sick, children, we need to be the people that say, it may need to have to happen. Yes, because self-defense comes first. But we'll never let our soul let go of that fact that that experience, there's a shade that we will never fully understand. Friends, the classic end of a drusha like this would be like the anthem of, of Israel as Atifa. We are the people of hope. We have been through enormous tragedy before, and we have succeeded. I do believe that's true. That would be the normal, quote-unquote, uplifting. I do believe in the depths of my heart that we will win. I do believe in the depths of heart that we will, you will, this will change the reality. But it will be at a very, very heavy price that we will be paying for the rest of our lives. So now is the time to hold each other close, to reach out to our brothers and sisters in Israel who are there, to be together as a congregation for those, each other, to pray, to send tzedakah, to make statements, to contact our, our leaders in our political entities here, to hold on, like literally just hold on. There is hope, but it's okay for now. To say, I don't have all the words to say. And just to cry. And just to be silent. And just to pray.